Thank you very much for coming. Um, so I know deployment of Rails is not interesting or exciting or remotely as cool as Kubernetes and containers and Docker nowadays. Um, so I'm going to get that out of the way. Um, but today I thought I'm going to show you what we've built, what we've got, and how we can help you and your team do Rails deployment. Um, but before I do that, um, there's a little bit of kind of history around why we did this, why why we ended up doing the rail the, the non-interesting solved problem of oh we already have Capistrano, what's wrong with that uh, kind of problem, and how we got to where we are. So Cloud Six Six started as a as a different company with a different name, doing a different thing, and we were a rail shop. We're still a rail shop, and we did this. Uh, like everybody else, we started with a PaaS provider, our friends over there, Heroku, we used to be their customers. So like everybody else, we started at Heroku. And uh, the, um, so I've been doing this for, for a long time, not, not classics, you split up, you know, like you, you guys have been doing Rails for a long time and I've worked in large and small companies and every time I start at Heroku and I leave Heroku. Um, now, the question for me was, why? Why? Why does? Why do we all love PaaS, like Engine Yard or Heroku? Um, you know, we really like it. But why do we all leave? And and uh, we we started asking this question as a diff as the different company that we were when we started thinking about leaving PaaS. We started asking this question from other people, like, why do you leave? Do you start? So I'm just going to risk my whole career right now. I'm going to ask you who has started something in Heroku in this. Just trust, trust hands. You guys done Heroku before? Okay. And how many projects, like say, you know, you start with Heroku and you end up not moving out? Have you guys, are you still on Heroku? Or what you started? Yeah. You are? I'm looking to get off for right. Okay. So this audience might be slightly biased because you are here. Um, I'm guessing that you want to answer that, answer that question. But um, what we see is kind of what I call a pass cliff. We all start with PaaS and we fall off of that cliff pretty soon. Um, and the reasons are kind of different. A lot of people say cost, it gets expensive very quickly, which is an odd one because, you know, if you're doing really well, then we should be able to pay the bills, and, but somehow it's not. Sometimes it could be something around flexibility or vendor lock-in, regardless of what that is. I've even had cases that I used to work in a bank, a large bank, and you know I wanted to kind of put a, a proof of concept or a, like something, you know, just just a feasibility study sort of thing project together. And I did that at Heroku and just I go pass. I just went out to my colleagues and showed it off, and everybody loved it and I said, "Great, can we have it? I just want to put salespeople on it. You're going to sell the hell out of this thing." I was like, mm, "It's kind of running on a pass thing." It was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! No, 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 no!" So ops guys come in and they take over and they want to run it in like you know kosher way and on all sorts of things. And I'm just like, okay, I'm never going to start with PaaS again. So we jumped. And the jump turned out to be a different business. It actually turned out to be our business. So this is kind of what it looks like. You jump, and then you realize there's a lot of duct tape and that kind of stuff involved. Um, so today I wanted to, instead of talking about this, I wanted to show you what we've done and what this jump looked like, what we had to build ourselves to be able to deploy a Rails application in a way that gives us the same experience that we really love about a PaaS provider, but we are in charge. We are in control of the cost. We benefit from the cost cutting or the price wars that are going on between, say, Amazon and Google, and they keep cutting the cost of every CPU cycle, and we don't get the benefits of. When we were running on a PaaS, we also wanted to be able to experiment with new technologies like, you know, we have time series data and then we want to go and use a time series database or use Bolt or some other cool technology that our developers want to use and all of a sudden we can't find it on our PaaS provider so we have to go and add it as an external entity into the whole deployment and then it creates these things called snowflakes. And, you know, when you get an email about Amazon having an issue with heart bleed or meltdown or whatever else and they say, you know what, just shut down your EC2 instance and restart it and it moves into an improved thing and you go, everybody goes, ooh, that server, they want to shut it down. We have some stuff on that. And, you know, it's supposed to be, you shut it down, start it, run a puppet or a chef <coughs> script again and it should work, but we all know it doesn't. So let me show you a, um, a quick demo of uh, what we've got 
will be built. So this is Classic 6 dashboard, what it looks like. And um, on the left, I have one uh, container-based Kubernetes ramp, all the cool stuff, application that I used for, for, for other demos. When we are talking about our container products, we have four products. Two of them are Framework, Rails, and Node, and the, the other two are SkyCath and Maestro, which are about building a Kubernetes cluster and also deploying your application into an existing Kubernetes cluster. So Maestro builds your Kubernetes cluster for you, and SkyCap deploys your application onto any Kubernetes cluster that you might have, whether it's Maestro, or you get it from, say, GKE, from Google, from Amazon, or whoever else. But the, but the focus of what I wanted to show today is on, um, on the, our Rails product. Um, so how do we start? What we wanted was, we wanted to build something that starts from the code and ends up in production. So if you think about you know, your, your typical PaaS experience, on one hand, you have your code, and it then goes to production. Well, that's great. And every time you commit into Git, it builds, you know, does the tarballing and all that sort of stuff, and then rolls it out. What we wanted was to just slightly modify that image, that model, and say, on one side, we connect your Git repository, and we get the code. On the other side, you connect your cloud provider of your own choice, under your own account. We fire up the servers that we need. We then configure and provision those servers to run your application, and then we do the deployment. And the catch here was, how do we know what kind of servers we need? It's not like a generic server that runs everything, right? So if I go and read my Rails application, it says, I have Dolly, so it means that I have memcached, and I have some sort of Redis gem, so I need Redis, and I have Postgres as well, then what kind of servers are we gonna create? Are we gonna create all different servers, like one each, or put all of them into one? How do we go about doing that? So this is how a flow kind of looks like. And these are the different products that I mentioned. So I go to Rails, and I'm gonna choose one of our sample projects. So this is a simple Rails application, as you can see. It's a typical Rails uh, app that we put together. <coughs> it uses um, MySQL, but um, you, know, you can see there's a Docker file here, but this is, this is not used in this demo. Uh, you can also see there's a .class66 folder here with some extensions around like you know, environment variables that you want to put in. You don't need to use any of that. This is not necessarily used, used part of this app, but we'll get to that later. So I'm gonna just start deploying this. Take the git repository URL, go here, use that. It's a public repository, so I'm gonna use the HTTP. Use the branch master, call it Rails Conf. Three, and I'm running a live demo, so demo gods are gonna help, hopefully. Um, <coughs> but I have some that I've already prepared earlier. Um, I don't have a video of it, so if there's no Wi-Fi, I'm toast. We're gonna have to improvise. Um, so what hap what's happening now? We connect into the Git repository, we pull the code, code out, and we look at some you know, pointers. Gem file, gem file lock, database YAML, um, also, some other configuration files that we all put there. So the great thing about Rails is we all know it's convention-based, so you can you know, deduce a lot of things from those conventions. So what did we find out? We are using Rails in production, um, which we specified as the environment. This is using Rails 4.2.8 and the Ruby 2.1.5, and we've flipped everything to run on Fusion Passenger. Here you can choose to run Unicorn, Puma if you want, but that's the default setting, which means that it runs Nginx with Fusion Pad Passenger on top of it. The back end is my SQL, obviously. It wasn't you know, like a super genius thing to find out. It was in my gem file. And deploy hooks are what we have um, in the .cloud66 folder, which basically says, I have this custom package I want to install on a certain type of servers, so you kind of use it that way. And the reason for that is, instead of you know, jumping on a server with a bash and just installing the thing so the next time you don't remember what you've done on one specific server, we want to kind of try and nudge people into doing it the right way and scripting it out instead of uh, doing it post-deployment. We also do support proc files, which we all know if we are, we've used um, Heroku, but it's basically back-end jobs and things that run. So if you think about Cloud 66, we do a lot of dock rooting. We install, we install, kind of deploy Cloud 66 with Cloud 66. It's kind of an inception sometimes. Um, but the idea is that um, if you think about our process and how we manage these things, so we run Rails, Cloud 66 stack itself, 
is Rails, and the backend jobs are on a sidekick. Now, if you think about how long does it take to get a server from, say, AWS, about a minute, maybe two, then you have to install packages on it and then reboot it and all sorts of things. So end to end, your deployment might get from five minutes to 20, 25 minutes. We have customers in about 110 countries. There are about 12,000 developers. On a daily basis, about 600 of them use Cloud 6.6 to deploy about, I don't know, five to 6,000 times. You do the maths, you realize that there's no time that any sidekick is going to be quiet. So how do we deploy? And that's the kind of the thing that we had to build and it turned out to be a good product as well to build the business around, um, it's kind of solving those problems. How do you do those things? So when I mentioned that around truck files, I wanted to tell you that those are the things that are, we, we try to take care of automatically for you because Rails is such a great um, framework that's got lots of opinion baked into it. Here you can add environment variables if you want. Um, I've locked in my Ruby version here in my gem file, but if it wasn't locked, I would be given a drop down that I could choose what I want. As you can see, this is a very Rails specific, um, or has a deep understanding of what Rails is. So you can you know, understand things like Rails Asset Pipeline um, or DB Schema Loads and things like that. Now, on to adding a cloud provider. We do support about, I think, nine cloud providers, if I'm not mistaken, as well as bringing your own server. So if you're running on any of these cloud providers, you're all good. You can just connect it to your account, depending on your authentication method, of that cloud provider. If there's AWS, you can just get the API keys. If it's DigitalOcean, it's OAuth and all sorts of things. But if you happen to run on, say, Hetna or OVH or some bare metal provider, uh, apart from Packet, which we do support here natively, you can then bring them in with something we call uh, registered servers, which is drop a bash file, a bash command onto the server. It calls back home, registers itself. You need to have Ubuntu on it, and that's basically it. And it becomes part of your what we call a cluster. So I have added my DigitalOcean account here, as you can see, and I get to choose what region of the um, DigitalOcean I want to deploy to, and each region has whatever server types that it supports. I get to choose those. So here is the part that I was I was I was telling you about. How do you kind of uh, what's the topology? To use a very you know big word, um, but how do you actually distribute this app? So for us, the Rails uh, part sits on a a server at this point, and on the other part, my SQL in this case, which is the only other component that I have in this example, you can choose to say share it with the Rails, which is not good practice for production, but for the purpose of this demo, I think it's fine. You're gonna forgive me. Or fire up a new server on the same cloud, same account, same data center, same availability zone if you want to, or use an external server from like, uh, you know, a registered server somewhere else, which brings me to hybrid. You can, combine multiple clouds with this. Um, as well as that, um, what you can do here is that you, you start with a small skeleton of the application. We don't wanna say, tell me everything about this upfront. You have production, you don't know how many servers you're gonna need. You don't know how it's going to actually you know, turn out to be. So we start with one server of each type if you want, and then you can scale out as you want. All right, so let's just go ahead and click deployment. Now, what's gonna happen now? So <clears throat> we're gonna connect to DigitalOcean. If I have my DigitalOcean login still logged in. Right, so in a minute, that guy is going to fire up a DigitalOcean server here. There we go. So that started that, we give it an animal name. You can see gazelle, impala, and all sorts of things. Sometimes they come out like compassionate pigs or some weird names, but I think we're lucky today. Um, I'm just gonna give this a different name. I can rename it here. I'm just gonna put a long here. And the reason for that is we have a process in the background. Uh, as you can imagine, we fire up a lot of servers on a lot of clouds, so we call it janitor, and it comes and cleans up all the servers that we fired up. If you don't put a long in there, middle of the demo, the server's gonna disappear, which is a cool thing, you'll see how, how it works. But, um, so what's gonna happen now? We fire up the server, or servers that we, we agreed, then we check for the compatibility based on the base, best image that's available on that cloud provider, then we check for the kernel, if there's a need for a kernel update, we do that. Any packages that need updates, so all sorts of things, setting up automatic updates for security, 
um, you know, installation of any, everything or anything that's needed. So for example, in your gem pilot, let's say you have uh, image magic. Then image magic requires a bunch of things that you need to install. We install all those, all, all, all those things. If you have any custom packages that you need to install, that's also done. And all of that then ends up being a server with an IP address that then call back, calls back and then gives us the IP address. If your cloud provider pr supports private public networks, for example, a private I and a NIC and a, and a public NIC, we do get those IP addresses back, the IPv6 and all sorts of things around that, we get it back. You get a chance of kind of drilling down into all the logs of what preparing, for example, of the server is. And here you can see, you know, we install a UFW as a firewall manager. Um, all sorts of um, action activities that are happening right now. So let me go back to one that I created with the same stack. So this is what it looks like at the end. I've got my server created at the top. When was it deployed? Just earlier today. I have a Rails server and a SQL server and a process server which uh, holds my um, proc files. If I go in there, so there's a worker and a scheduler. I think they are um, sidekick um, that are running here. And on my SQL server, here, I can, I can see my MySQL server with uh, MySQL things that are running on it. But it's sharing a server, it's obviously sharing a server with, uh, with my Rails one. Okay, so let's just see what the site's like. It's just a simple Rails app, you dump whatever it gets in the header. If you notice here, it's a DNS record that's created for this. And this is quite an interesting thing. So, Obviously, every server that you fire up has a public IP address, you can access that, and you can block that and say, I don't want this application to be accessible publicly, you can do that. But we also create a DNS record for you the same way that, for example, Heroku does, and that is pointing to the head of that stack. If you have a single server, it points to that one. If you add a load balancer, then it points to the load balancer, it changes that, and it's a short response, you know, short TTL to point to that server. Um, as well as that, you can, have, you can have a DNS server that points to every single of one of those servers and you can change your DNS record to point to that. So, okay, so now I have my stack, great. Now that was, uh, that was easy. Now, what else can I do? So now at this point, you have your application up and running. It's working. But it looks like this. Now, here you can add a load balancer or add your backup, backup to your databases. So, as you notice, I deployed this on DigitalOcean and I choose to deploy it without the DigitalOcean load balancer. I want to have HA proxy. I can do that. If I were to deploy that onto, say, Amazon, then here the load balancer option would be an ELB or an ALB that you can deploy. And that decouples you from the intricacies of that cloud provider, which means that you can get the application and move it from one cloud provider to another one with the same topology. You can say, I have a, unit, my, you know, a load balancer under my SQL and I can just move it from one place to another one. So you can do that. You can also create database backups for my database. So here I can say, I want to manage backup, which means the backups taken of your database, says all databases. So if you have like say MySQL, Postgres, and Redis, all of them as a snapshot are taken at the same time. The files are then compressed, encrypted with your passwords, and they're shipped to the closest S3 uh, region that you want, or the one that you specifically want. If you're, for example, running it in, say, Germany, there are data residency requirements, which means that you have to move it only to the Frankfurt S3. All those things are taken care of. How frequently you want it, whether you want it a binary one, which means it's much faster, or you want a text one, which you can then inspect manually, and you can create a backup here. So this is stack, the one that I showed you earlier. This one has both databases back, backed up and load balanced. And here I can download it or restore it. And when I say I want to restore it, it basically goes to all the databases that I have. Postgres, Redis, everything that I have, and it just restores that back. So if you combine that with the code and the git ref that is deployed, you have a time machine. You can go back and forth, back and forth in there. One note is that you can use this with um, your own database if you want. So if you're using, you know, Heroku Postgres or Cloud SQL Postgres or RDS from Amazon, you can do that if you want to. You don't have to use the databases that come here. And the same with load balancers. And the last one around here is that SSO certificates. 
if you choose, if you have your own SSL certificates, you can add it here and it will add it to the load balancer or to the server Nginx depending on the topology. So you just say, I want to have SSL and it will add it to the load balancer as a load ba SSL termination if you have a load balancer. If you don't, then it will be added to the Nginx. And if you, if, if you say, I want to start a small and I just want to add an SSL certificate to my only server that I have at the Nginx level, and it just works. And sometimes if your colleague comes and says, Ooh, why is this thing running without any load balancer? They will go and add a load balancer. We then detect that. We move the load balancer. Uh, we move the SSL certificate from Nginx all the way to back to the, to the load balancer so it doesn't disrupt your service. So that is not going to break anything. And if you choose to go with Let's Encrypt, we call Let's Encrypt API. We get the SSL certificate. We put the reminders in there and we do it automatically every three months. So you have that. We are in the process of supporting version two, which has wildcard as well. So that gives me the kind of the basic running of the Rails. How do I set it up and all sorts of things. Now, <coughs> here you can see that I have two processes and they're running, they're both green, all good. Now, database is a little bit more on that. So here we have a, we have a database, a single database, it's my SQL. What I can do here is I can create replication. I can simply say I want another database server. And that's essentially scaling up the server, the database server for me. Now here what we do, we natively support replication for MySQL, Postgres, Redis, uh, Memcached, Elasticsearch, and, I, and MongoDB. So we do the replication for each one of them the native way they actually support. So you talk about MySQL, we do a master slave. You want to do Postgres, we know what write ahead files and how to sync them and all sorts of things. And not only do we do the replication, but the system also supports replication verification across different data centers. So you, oftentimes when you set up replication, you see that you have like two different availability zones and you want to have like high availability. So you put the master on one side and the read only slave on another data center and the connectivity sometimes is not great. If you have a lot of throughput in terms of writing a lot of inserts, the slave might need time to catch up and they go out of sync. So when you set up a replication with Cloud 66 Rails stack, the replication setup is verified and it's constantly being checked for whether it's in sync or not and we keep it up to date or if we cannot, for example, you just lose connection between the two servers, we'll let you know. These are all the things that we had to build to just get back to where we were on a PaaS provider. And on the other side, if I go to my source code, now in this case, I have a backup verifier as well. So um, this is a, as you can see, it's a MySQL query. What happens is this is a backup verifier. So if, if we find that file um, called, you know, under that uh, backup verifier for MySQL for production, that specific environment, it means that every time I run a backup, I want you to put that, ship that backup to another server, unzip it, decompress it, unencrypt it, or de-encrypt it, and then put it into uh, into that specific database, then run this query, and this query should return a true or false, which means we verify the backups every time, and you get a green tick for the verification of the backups as well. So it's not only about um, you know, whether you have a backup, but the backup is going to work when you need it, because that's the worst thing that could happen if it didn't. Um, now, <clears throat> onto the deployments. Here's my deployment, and this is the one that's live. And every deployment that I do is going to show up there so I can see the commits that have gone into this. And it's like gives me a visual history of what's happened. On configuration files, now that's an interesting part. So <coughs> this is not a you know, pass, obviously. So it's not lots of things are hidden, but we don't, didn't want them to be hidden. Like, for example, we install Nginx. We want you to be able to shell into the server that you, what we've set up for you, and you look at things, you look around, and kind of feel that you've done it yourself. It's just done for you. It's not an alien black box. As a result, for example, if you think about deploying Nginx, what would you do if you were to deploy Nginx yourself? You would write the configuration file for Nginx, deploy Nginx, and apply that configuration file. And this is what we do here. So if you're familiar with Nginx configuration, you will recognize that, that as a um, Nginx configuration, with a small difference of these double curly brackets around here. Now if you've used Shopify, you, you know about Shopify Liquid, for example, which is a rendering uh, way, of a safe way of rendering a markup language, if you will, for, for files, and this supports that. So you can say, you know, number of worker processes comes from this variable, or you can have if statement, for example, if you want, around this. What happens here is 
that then we get those base template that we have here, and then we render it with the values that you have, and then we generate a real executable Nginx configuration and push it to all the servers that we've in, in, installed Nginx on. What does that give you? One, it gives you consistency across all the components that are installed. So there's, you don't have these snowballs and snowflakes that have one of them is Nginx is slightly different. Sometimes it happens, and it happens to us, that you know, something goes wrong and during the weekend, some ops guy jumps on a server, shells into it and fixes that and nobody knows what's happened. And one of the servers go out of sync. So we detect those differences and we bring it up and we show you that there is an issue. There is, one of them is different. This nudges, again, will nudge us into doing it the right way, but if you don't, you still get that notification. The second thing that it gives you is that it gives you kind of a constant update. So we did this a long time ago, I think 2013, if I'm not mistaken. And right after that, uh, the Snowden thing happened and they said, oh, not only NSA reads whatever you say, but um, they record the encrypted traffic. So if they want, they can then run something afterwards, which meant all of a sudden, all of our customers were asking for perfect forward secrecy, uh, which would prevent that from happening. So what we did with this was, this is backed by Git. As you can see, there's a Git repository backing this. So you don't need to use the web UI if you're familiar, if you're, if you're more comfortable with using Git, which like I am. I go to command line, clone that Git repository and do my thing. But Cloud66 acts as a yet another developer in your team. So let's say tomorrow, Snowden says something else and then we're gonna have to add that. You're gonna have to go and say, you know, I need to add perfect forward secrecy number two to this, or there's Heartbleed or Nginx patch. We pull that repository, we make the patch, and we try to merge it like your, you would do. And if it goes in, great. You, you get to choose to say, I wanna deploy that. If there's a conflict, you see the diff file, you, you can resolve the conflict and then push it in. That means you get to benefit from all the things that happen in our network. Now, as I said, Cloud66 product, Rails product, powers about 2,500 unique workloads, something about 5,000 to 6,000 different applications with different sizes. So oftentimes we find ourselves in the position of running in front of our customers, finding out issues like a canary in a kind of a, in a coal mine, and then we bring it back to our customers before they, before they face it. Uh, they see that there's a patch for some configuration file that's there. Um, but if you want to manage that yourself, you, you, you know, feel free, you can do that. And if what you do doesn't conflict with any patches that are coming in, great, you're going to benefit from that. And as you can see, this is installed, this is available to you for all components that are installed. So it's not just the Nginx part, but also, uh, you know, any, um, MySQL, for example, has its own native one as well as my HA proxy. So I can customize everything to my heart content if I want to. Now onto the network settings. Um, here is the, the firewall settings that we have. So from Cloud66, which we have a publicly available set of IP addresses, we open 22 if you want to have a bastion server in the middle to lock us out when you don't want to, when there's no deployment happening, or you want to have a bastion server that we do have access to, but your ops guys has to give permission to your devs guys to deploy during a certain window of time, you can do that. But these are the kind of statically created, dynamically created versus statically applied um, uh, set of uh, configuration uh, files, uh, sorry, firewall rules. And here I can create the ones that I want, for example, from anywhere to my Rails servers, I wanna have TCP on a specific port that I have. Now, the best thing here that I find is this. We had a case of a customer who had a CRM application managed by one team. The CRM application had a database, the database had a list of customers. The marketing guy says another thing that would generate some spam email uh, and send it to some of the customers. The issue would come up that two teams were taking care of two, those two stacks. Sometimes there was a need for a load to, to, because there's a campaign, for example, going on. They would scale up the servers on the marketing side that will fire up new servers, will give them new IP addresses, then those IP addresses don't have access to the SQL server on the other stack, which had the list of customers. So every time they would scale, they would have to go to the other ops of the other, uh, the other team and say, can you add this IP address list? And worse than that, they would fall down, the scale down the stack on the, on the marketing side, and then there are a bunch of IP addresses still open to the MySQL server of the customer list, which now with GDPR is like actually even worse. 
Um, so, and then those IP addresses are reused by your cloud provider for another complete client of theirs, and that's just a security nightmare. So what we had to do was to say, you can create dynamic firewall rules. You can say from any rail server of this stack that I don't have access to, I don't know what it is, to all my MySQL servers on this side. And these are dynamically calculated. So as you go and scale up your MySQL, they inherit the right firewall rules. As the other team goes and scales up their worker servers on the other stack, then whatever rule dynamically is created is generated. So this is what we call a kind of an application-centric firewall. As well as that, I can, uh, I can, I can be naughty and uh, access the servers directly if I want to with having a lease, which just opens up with 10 to 20 minutes access and it shuts it down based on the IP address that I have if I want to really get into the, you know, the servers themselves. Traffic redirection rules and, um, and, and traffic access rules, you know, basic things that you, that you have there. One of the final things is Active Protect, which is, luckily I don't have anything there. Um, but what we do is that we monitor your servers for you at different levels, at the OS level, at the patch package and pack patch level, if there's any known vulnerabilities that are there, as well as that there are for every deployment that you do, for every component that you add to that, there are certain files that you wanna monitor. If you add Docker, for example, there are some files that you wanna monitor. If there's MySQL, you have some files that you wanna monitor for change whether it's changed inadvertently or maliciously, you want to be sure that you know, you know about that change. And those things will show up here. Um, as well as that, if there's an attempt um, for brute force access to your SSH or hitting your web servers repeatedly, they will be blocked and shown here. And that's the change files that I was, I was talking about. Environment variables, pretty much you know, self-explanatory with a small um, kind of caveat that you can refer to different stacks and environment variables as well. So for example, if you, again, in the example of the two stacks that I want to talk to each other, if you need the access, the access credentials to MySQL of another stack, but you don't know the, the, the password, and it might change in the future because of a password rotation, you can use the environment variable coming from another stack that you don't have access to, and it gets rendered and sent over to your servers without your developers having access to the real password itself. And every time it changes on one stack, it gets changed on the other side. And this is a basic kind of notifications that you can get on Slack, email, web hooks, um, about pretty much anything that happens in the system. And lastly, live logs. So we didn't want to build a log shipping and storage facility. There are really good solutions out there from you know, Logly to others that, that do this. But we found that oftentimes we wanted to take care of, just be sure what's going on right there as a live kind of logging mechanism. So every time you deploy something new or your application, the log files for it will be added here. Um, and you can just look at them here. You can have a look at the context around them um, if you want or you can have a kind of a basic search around it. And this is real time, we don't store it, it just gets shipped as you enable it and it will be shut down after 30 minutes. It's a very good facility that we found for debugging. Um, now, uh, this, this, this stack, I guess I have a connectivity issue, but um, on, the, on the ones that I've created, as you can see, I have this tiny thing called stack score here that gives me an A to B, a to F, green to red kind of scale. And if I go there, it gives me some hints about what's, what's wrong. So code, we do some code quality. If you want to connect it to code climate, you can do it as well. We don't have any backups on this production, so that's bad. That gives me an F score. Uh, connectivity, I'm sharing on production. I'm sharing like a database on the front end, so that's also bad. And you can fix all of those or ignore it if you want. And these kind of show you, and you get emails if the stack scores drop or improve as things kind of change. So that's what I wanted to show you. Um, uh, very quick run on everything that we do support. Obviously you have the basics of uh, you know, account management as well as the teams, which are very popular with, uh, with agencies that we work with. Um, if you look at the organizations, you can create multiple organizations that you, um, that you have, and you can switch between different organizations. So I feel if I switch my organization to another one, I see a completely different set of stacks that are there. And, um, and you have 
full access control on every single one of the actions that you can do, give it to different me team members. And we see that in, especially in agencies you have, people are assigned to projects and are taken off the project, or you wanna get, you hand over the keys to one project when it's done to your client, and the client wants to get one of your engineers onto their stack again because of some maintenance or improvements, and they can invite your engineers into this and then take, it, take the rights away. So it's, it's got all those kind of features in there built in, as well as that you see you have, a, you have audits, if you want, of every action that's happened, where did it happen, um, and what was the action, for example, the change in the environment variable. We keep the history of all those other things. So it's basically kind of very um, specifically built around Rails, but with some good ops practices around it that will allow you to kind of run, your, run your operations the way you used to having a pass, but it just works much more smoothly. Now, I've got about two, two, two or so minutes. If any, any questions, please uh, let me know. Yes, okay, so the question is, how do we manage memory spikes or managing your memory, uh, memory usage of a process that, that, that's running on the server? There are three things here. One is that um, based on the heuristics that we find, so we fire up, I don't know, somewhere a thousand something servers a day, not all of them keep running, but you know, people fire them up and they bolt it down. And based on those, we collect a lot of metrics about the behavior of the cloud provider with a specific component. So if you run Redis on DigitalOcean, Netherlands, data center AMS1, with this kind of server, this is the kind of a footprint that we see. And based on those, those configuration files that you saw, the custom config, we try to, to change those variables, the variables that get ended, end up in the rendering, based on those heuristics. So if you deploy MySQL onto, and I'm talking about these kind of prepackaged processes like MySQL, if you deploy it to AWS, and then you take that stack and move it to DigitalOcean, it might be that those variables change. You can influence it, you can fix it to whatever you want, but we apply those heuristics that we've learned onto that to optimize the performance of that. That's the first one. The second one is about the spikes and everything else. So we do collect the vital signs of the server by the memory, um, the processes, and uh, the disk, and uh, CPU usage. Those are kind of collected, and you can see it for the past, I think, six months. You can, you can have a look at it, and the disk, you can also have a threshold, and a trigger that gives you an email. If something goes wrong, you can get it. Uh, or you run out of disk, because operating systems don't really gracefully handle disk shortages. Um, but it's, and, and it's based on processes. Um, uh, so you can get the process metrics out. So that's kind of on the metric side. We also allow you to run sidecars and side processes as well to shut down something. So for example, say you have a huge, you add a huge uh, asset to your Rails application and the NPM uh, asset pipeline compilation just blows up, you know, gives you an OM and just blows up the whole thing. We can take care of those things as well. Some of them are Rails specific, like we see a lot of that around NPM, uh, sorry, node asset pipeline compilation that we take care of, we know what it means for Rails and stack. Some of them are generic, it might be a stack, you know, memory leak in your sidekick that you have, and we take care of that by either killing it or you are reverting back to the uh, kind of a native OS behavior around memory management. Does that answer your question? Cool. Any other question? Yes. So the question. Absolutely. So the question is, what's our process for taking uh, a, a workload from my, uh, from Heroku, for example, onto Cloud 66? There are signs of something you know you can see as you know as you know we we would detect, for example, MySQL. You know, we also detect something has been running on uh, on Heroku. There are signs to tell, and if we detect those things, we actually are more proactive, we show you something in Heroku Purple that says, it seems that you've been running this, Ooh, wow, that was efficient. Um, you've been running this on Heroku, here are the steps that you can take. If we cannot find those telltale signs, then still you, there is documentation around how to move each one of those things around code, database, and traffic. All right, well thank you very much um, for your time. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you can check us out at cloud66.com. We also have a booth at the, the exhibition. You can come and you know, ask more questions or you know, see the project and dem demo further things as well. Thank you. Thank you.